And then what is his, in fact, relapse prevention plan for that? Mm -hmm. And uh, most impressively, he had one. Um, but either through training or socialization, he just didn't find out and say, here's what I do. Mm -hmm. um, first, I'd like to say um, the interview was an exceptional interview. Um, <coughs> Thank you. you instilled empathy, respect, genuineness, the body tone, the gesture. And you open it for LC to come out and call you JC, which is important. It made him, in my sight as to what I was seeing, feel comfortable and he can speak to you in a comfortable manner. Um, and looking at LC and talking about his children, his children has went to service, has gotten good jobs and so forth. His nephews has followed into his footsteps. Mm. He sounds like um, that he's feeling a little guilty once he starts his little business. He wants to bring his nephews in with him. How would you relate back on that with LC of how to deal with the guilt? and the shame because he's trying to please others mm -hmm. and first he needs to work on LC before he work on trying to please everyone else. So how would yes. you work with LC on that in later sessions? Yeah. Uh, well thank you for those compliments. The, I guess I would see this bi-directional. LC is working on himself by trying to act as a role model for his uh, nephews uh, and he gets such tremendous uh, strokes for doing that. You do make a good point, and I thought that at once. He's quickly changing the focus to his nephew's life instead of his own. Uh, I would share such an impression uh, like that and suggest that we should be careful that we don't trip over uh, his self-care in order to reform his nieces and nephews out of that guilt. Uh, I think if the guilt became really paramount, uh, we would probably address that as a separate problem, either through something like exposure or EMDR or cognitive restructuring methods. Uh, guilt can, in small ways, act as a um, motive, but we know from lots of experience and research, guilt is rarely a powerful, consistent change method. Thank you. Thanks for the question. I was wondering if you would uh, do anything further <coughs> regarding support groups with this gentleman, if you were continuing to work with him. Um, I, I realize within the constraints of what it is that you were doing, it was not something that you could get into very much. But um, I, I guess one of the things that I was thinking with that is that in, in my experience, it has been very helpful to um, uh, offer people other ways to look at support groups. I mean, many people will say right off the bat, not for me, mm -hmm. you know, um, but what I found to be really useful has been to um, try and engage people around, are you willing to try it? You know, what, what is it that you don't like about these things? Um, what, uh, uh, what kinds of concerns might you have about this? Um, or people that have gone initially to, to groups saying like, oh, nobody there was, had anything to do with me. Well, you know, maybe there's something to that. Maybe they need to find a group that's got different characteristics, or maybe they're going in with a mindset that's, that's going to um, uh, conflict with what it is they could get out of the group. And I've, again, I found it useful to you know, work with people around that and you know, focus on the similarities, not the differences, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, uh, what I was wondering, though, is if you would do anything further with him around support groups, um, and uh, if, uh, if you would you know, work with, with somebody in terms of offering some alternative sorts of ways of looking at things, you know, given the um, uh, emphasis on meeting the person with where they're at. That's a fine question because, as you note, it is a common clinical phenomenon. Very few people take immediately to the suggestion for a support group. Um, I'm guessing 20 or 25 percent, and even then, uh, they need lots of reassurance, informal cognitive therapy, couldn't someone go with me? Uh, all kinds of ways to get them there first. Uh, the thoughts that come to mind are, uh, are uh, two or threefold. First, I uh, take what the patient initially gives me in order to establish a sense of rapport and respect. Once that relationship continues to build, uh, then I revisit all kinds of areas. See, I, I don't think of it only as treatment and support groups uh, or 12-step groups. I think about all of this a little more globally I would revisit not only support groups, but exercise, potentially medication, spirituality, mm -hmm. uh, self-change, going to his mother's more often, volunteer work, nutritional improvement. 
what is it that he may profit by? And if he is, in his experience, or in my conceptualization, prematurely closing down any of those options, I would certainly revisit them. Because uh, so many people report uh, miraculous support and outcomes from support groups, that's probably one area I would return to more quickly than another. Uh, so my answer is definitely yes, asking him to look at it differently, try a different group to go with someone. If, tw if a 12-step program isn't what he's about, that uh, perhaps some of the other groups um, might be a little more amenable. I find some patients prefer to go to AA rather than NA or CA or all kinds of other configurations. The idea is to experiment, but experiment uh, more broadly uh, with all these potentially life-enhancing treatments. Um, <clears throat> the floor is open to any type of question now, whether it be you know, specifically about the interview or generally about the approach. Oh, okay. Um, is there a time frame to move from one stage to the other, is there a time limit that the therapist has to have in mind that within a week or two weeks, this client should be able to move from one stage to the, uh, to the other stage? And secondly, if a client, um, for example, gets to preparation stage, is it possible to backslide back to pre-contemplation mm. at any stage? Well, they're good questions. Uh, the first one. Uh, we would like to have a time limit if only clients would cooperate. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is session two. You must be in preparation now because that's where we're going. <laughs> People move at such different rates uh, and need such different things. Um, our research shows that without formal treatment, some people can stay in contemplation 30, 40 years. Uh, witness alcoholics or smokers or cocaine abusers who are there for 30 years. They can tell you it's a problem. They can tell you they like to change it, but there they sit. Uh, we call them the chronic contemplators. They've taken a post-dated check from life. Uh, so, no, unfortunately, there's not a specific um, time period. Do people go back? Not typically, um, with, with one exception. As people move through, it's pretty much consistent. But like in any stage, you have an early part of it and an end part of it. Um, so someone, for example, in early preparation may make some tentative steps to do something, but then the anxiety comes back, they realize it wasn't a good plan, and they say, well, I'm not even ready for that small step, and they jump back to contemplation. But that contemplation to preparation stage, it's just sort of a mini recycling. Uh, and is actually very helpful to say we didn't adequately conceptualize the problem and the plan or the, the treatment isn't going to be adequate for that. Um, of course, the, the big circle back is the relapse or the recycle. But beyond that, once they move into action, they keep moving to action. And even if the first action strategy doesn't work, they very rarely go back into pre-contemplation. They go back into contemplation. And about 90% of the cases, according to our research, if it doesn't work, They'll say, okay, that one didn't work, and then we work with them on the lessons of recycling. What did you learn? What are we going to do different? So rather than just feeling like you're snowballing down, 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 we, that's why we prefer the word recycling. What did we learn from this time about you, your disorder, the treatment that's going to help us next time do it better? Because we are human. I, I got a question for you. You may not want to address, <laughs> but I know from, uh, De Clementi's and Prochaska's work that they feel the stages of change idea works at a lot of different levels and that societies go through uh, uh, processes of change, that organizations go through uh, processes of change. So as I, I'm listening to you talk, and I'm, I'm impressed with what you did with the client and I'm also impressed with the model. Um, I can see a lot of applicability to it, but one of the, th and you talk consistently as have other presenters in, as part of this process about research-based uh, therapy processes. Where would you characterize the addiction field in terms of stages of change? And how do we move it? What, what's yeah. got to be done? <laughs> you know, I actually gave a talk on this once. Um, you have to remember that the stages of change are problem specific. So I broke it down into three or four different areas. And I said, so let me go through those. 
and to uh, enhance rapport with my audience and make people feel good, I always begin where maintenance was. And I said, where maintenance is now um, is that you believe in self-help and support groups. Early on, we didn't believe that at all. Uh, we're in maintenance. Everyone realizes treatment is not the sole answer and that people coming together to help each other is magnificent. Mm -hmm. so we're in maintenance. We are in action uh, in terms of trying to develop ways of getting people out of dogmatic, rigid stances. Um, I certainly uh, appreciate the extra real-life experience, for example, of ex-addicts helping others. But when someone comes up to me and says, well, I'm sorry, uh, you can't work with this person because you're not an addict yourself or re in recovery, uh, I immediately say, is there any research or experience that would show that? Uh, or because, which to me is almost narcissistic, because this worked for me, ergo, it will work for you. We're in action stage. We become more integrative, more pluralistic, but a lot of people are struggling because they believe in the one single truth, and that's with a capital T. But we're there, and people can talk about it. Um, this uh, videotape series, in fact, is a testament to that. Uh, different perspectives, and we're getting a little more pluralistic, that what worked for you or for that person may not work for another person. We're certainly not maintenance for that. And another so-called problem area is the integration of research into the addictions. Mm -hmm. I think we're just in preparation. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes faith has triumphed over research. Mm -hmm. And in my view, research is nothing but the collective experiences, very systematically, of millions of people. So I would say maintenance for integrating uh, self-help and support groups. I would say uh, action for being more, more pluralistic and tailoring or customizing treatment to the person. And then uh, probably preparation for integrating the best of research into the addictions field. Earlier, you had mentioned the uh, using the stages of change with uh, individuals with a dual diagnosis. Mm. Could you speak a little bit more about that? Um, what specific part of it? Virtually everyone I see has multiple problems. Um, so uh, people say I must be naive when I don't answer that more directly. Uh, I don't see single diagnosis or dual diagnosis or triple diagnosis. I see people with a multitude of problems, some which will merit another diagnostic criteria and some that won't. For example, LC's procrastination. I see it's a problem area. Uh, and it may be easily resolved with some cognitive restructuring or a little support, or it might be, in fact, part of a larger avoidant personality. Um, so as you're treating people uh, with a series of problems, it's easy to put them in discrete little piles and say, well, here's a mental health problem and here's an addictive problem. Um, those, I want to call them almost arbitrary categorizations, are an unfortunate residue of how the addictions field has been split from the mental health field and vice versa. Um, so dual diagnosis is about the only type of patients I know. People with multiple interrelated concerns in living. Uh, uh, Dr. Nor uh, Norquist, I've really enjoyed uh, the session and observing you. Uh, you were ex exceptionally effective. I felt with a client. Uh, your model, as you demonstrated it, to me would apply to uh, any person with a problem. Uh, it, it should be effective with people with a wide variety of problems in social functioning. Um, I, I think 